in this wonderful day when we celebrate mothers, if you'll turn to James chapter 1, verse 27, I want to talk a little bit about America, where we live, and the state and status of our nation, and the fact that there's such great need. Of course, there's always great need. There's never been a time in human history when there wasn't great need. God allows us to be in need so that he might fill the need. Whatever you're in need or whether you're in distress or you're under adversity, you understand as a believer that God doesn't allow those things to harm you. They're all about training you. They're all about helping you grow stronger, turning you, correcting you. But in James chapter 1, he's talking to some people, to some believers who are pompous hearers of the word and yet have not yet become doers. And he's encouraging them about what, what he'd like to see in their life as far as the overflow of ministry from them. And he says in verse 27, this is pure and undefiled religion. By that he means spiritual service. In the sight of our God and Father to visit or take care of orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We have a principle here that one of the ways that God... Uh, declares that he would like for us to manifest our ministry life is by caring for those who are motherless, fatherless. So on this Mother's Day, I wanted to emphasize this, the, the importance of mothers and talk a bit about those that have no mother, have had no mother, and then encourage us a bit about filling that gap in our own life, in our own area. Uh, let me just read a few statistics. Uh, 8% of the homes, and, and these are pretty recent, in the United States are without a mother. Uh, there's about 125 million homes, so you can do the math. 24% uh, are without a father, which is insane. In the 60s, 1960, the census taken was, I think, the 96% of the homes had a mother and a father. So since the 60s, the, the, the degeneration of our nation, uh, as we move farther and farther into this liberal uh, relativism and away from divine principles, everything just falls apart. It's always the case. The farther away you move from God and the principles of divine operating, the, everything just comes apart. It's just that simple. I mean, the only thing that holds the world, the universe together is the Word of God. Jesus himself keeps the thing going. So when you let him go, you're going to spin off out of control, and that's what's happened in America. And it doesn't matter who's the president or what the politics are doing or what the Democrats are doing or whatever. It has nothing to do with our life apart from just passing interest, really. You know, I mean, our life is spiritual. The great issue in the first century when Jesus came was the fact that he was there to establish a spiritual kingdom, and everybody thought he was there to establish an earthly kingdom. And everything is so difficult for us to ever get away from the idea that all this is about an earthly existence. We're spiritual beings living in an, an earthly ex existence. We're, we're sojourners. We're travelers. We're visitors. We don't really belong here. We don't belong here. Do you not know that? Do you not feel that in your bones? That something's not right? I mean, you look around in your life, and there's something wrong with everything, including me. Definitely. Definitely something wrong with me. So... 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from a fatherless or motherless home. 85% of the kids in schools that, that are classified as behavior issues, there's a parent missing. Listen, 
bad parenting is better than no parenting. It's better than no parenting. Now, there is a line. Abusive parenting, physical abusive, is not good. No one's advocating that. But 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless or motherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless or motherless homes. And, and 75% of all as adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers and rehab come from fatherless or motherless homes. So when, when a parent drops out, and listen, especially a mother, ask Timothy when you get to heaven. If it hadn't been for his mother and his grandmother, yeah, I mean, they did the job without a father. They did the job. It can be done. It's doable. Now, Timothy missed some things. There was an influence in his life. He was, he was timid because he never had a father to model himself after with the strength and the, the, the draw-the-line type courage. But uh, Timothy got raised up and got saved and became a produ productive member of the Christian life. So, through mothers. Almost a third of the homes in the United States are one-parent homes. Listen, we can't survive like that. We can't survive like that. And I know people are encouraged because uh, uh, we wondered if maybe the country had gone completely liberal and maybe now we think maybe it's not completely liberal. I'm not sure it matters. If, if our influence, if our influence, if our life before God as the pivot, as the core of the true Christian life does not shine before God, then this country will go down, will just, dis we'll just disintegrate from within. I mean, generation after generation after generation of children have been raised in one parent or no parent homes. And so children who grew up in a, in a one parent home are now raising children in a one parent home. And it just rolls downhill. You do understand this, right? You're aware of this? So, since the 50s, with the era of no-fault divorce, the divorce rate has remained about at 50%. This causes the children in these homes to live without a parent, or, or in the case of remarriage, to live with a step-parent. And that's a step-parenting that, you know, listen, you got to take all these stats with a grain of salt because these are compiled by worldly people who have worldly ideas about what healthy is and unhealthy is. So you, you, you look at it, and it's just a way of saying stuff's kind of messed up. You know, that's my, that's my uh, professional opinion. Stuff's kind of messed up. That's like a Trump saying, you know, you know we've got to figure out what's going on. Uh, but uh, the destruction of divine institutions of marriage and family have caused the children from these marriages to be mentally unhealthy, often carrying a great deal of false old man beliefs about themselves, relationships, and life itself. And listen, this old man baggage that has, they've picked up, see, they've gotten the wrong idea about how life works and what it's all about. And I'll get in that a little bit more because it's real important to understand what happens to a child when there's no mother, especially? Uh, my, one of my professors, uh, human development professor, said the worst thing that can happen to a child is to have a depressed mother. Well, there's one thing worse than that, and that's to have no mother. No mother. And that is the case in a lot of places, even in this country. The loss of a parent, especially a mother, to death or divorce leaves a big hole in a child's human development leading to many emotional and behavioral problems as adults. It's going to be difficult without the Lord, and even with the Lord, unless you're in a, in a church where you can grow and have your needs met and learn how to connect with the Lord and lay aside unhealthy ideas, you're not going to be able to fulfill your own marriage. It's going to be hard to stay married as a person that comes out of that whole unhealthy system. So let's talk 
some principles here. First, the imp- let's talk about the impact of a mother on her children. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 talks about the mother is a teacher. Mothers are teachers. And they're different teachers than fathers. And these are generalizations. So I'm not trying to, you say, well, that's not the case in my house. Okay, I'll allow that. I'm just talking in general. The Bible says that this this mother in, in question here is a teacher. She helps her babies learn basic life skills. She corrects and instructs them with compassion, with patience. She does it kindly, gently. She She doesn't lose her patience as a rule with her children. She picks them back up and lets them go again and picks them back up and lets them go again. And I'm amazed at mothers. Uh, I mean, I, I married a lady that's a wonderful mother, so I couldn't imagine. Listen, I grew up in a home with a mother who loved me, but who, who had a lot of problems, a lot of issues. That created a lot of issues in my life as a young adult. It's taken me to 60 years old to be able to work a lot of that stuff out, to get rid of that old way of thinking, to think, to to surrender to the Lord, to let the Lord handle a lot of stuff. But one of the great things that's happened in my life, uh, and I can say all this since she's not here, is that I, I, I married a lady that had a good mother as a pattern and has, has been a strong mother to our children, and these kids have a chance they have a chance to, to be something that I just didn't start with, and I'm just amazed by that. But it's a great thing. I just watch and see how the patience, just the refusal to get upset, the refusal to react, the determination just to keep nurturing, keep nurturing, keep nurturing, even when they're 38 years old and, you know, See, and, and one of the problems is when that nurturing spirit becomes this domineering spirit. And, you know, sometimes it's hard for mother to let go. Uh, yeah, well, I'll just let that be. Uh, in Proverbs thirty-one twenty-six, it says, "A mother, This mother speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She gives wisdom. She's a teacher. She's an instructor. She's a guide. She's a loving, nurturing, powerful, love-giving maniac. Uh, A mother's bond with her baby teaches the baby that love exists and is available to the child. Now, you you wouldn't think that a baby would have to be taught that love exists exist but you would be wrong because without a mother to teach a baby that love exists the baby doesn't know that exists i'll show that to you in a minute women are uniquely designed to give love in the form of compassion and tenderness just 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 designed for it just designed for it i love to, i love to hear women when they're happy the women when they're happy they sing when they talk, they sing. You ever heard that? They just start, they just sing. Their little voices are up and down, and children love and respond to that type of animated uh, uh, expression of love. And God designed women and mothers to be that, especially in the younger phases of life, to be that teacher, that nurturing spirit. Mothers teach through play. One of the great lessons is through play. Mothers play with their babies. They teach them through daily living to develop habits and patterns of behavior. Uh, Now the child becomes aware of the existence of love, warmth, compassion, and help for living out their life. They become aware of it through mother. Now when there's no mother, father can, can provide that kind of nurturing, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Mother's patience and tenderness allows a child to fail repeatedly without being chastised. She encourages him or her to get up and go again. Just remember Rhonda helping our kids learn to walk. Just, you know, when they'd run right into the wall and, you know, I'd go, 
have to laugh a little bit, but she'd just go over and pick them up, you know, dust them off, and go again. A child learns a sense of self and a sense of self-value and importance from his mother's loving eyes. A mother's loving eyes, when a mother reflects back to a child, you're important to me. I care deeply about you. That instills in this child the awareness, I'm important. I'm important to someone. I, I, I hate if you're a person that missed out on that. If you missed out on that, you don't know what that is. You have a difficult time in your adult life living emotionally intimate. Life to you is about doing, not about relating. And all, listen, with the Lord, the Lord is all about relating. Doing comes from relating, period. It's all about relating. Listen, God doesn't need us to do anything. You don't, you don't think... He created, this, he created the universe with a spoken word, and he needs me. Jesus said if the people were silent, the rocks would preach the message. He could do better with a rock. It's a relating. Mothers teach children to relate. It's a relationship. I remember Zach said, you know, he's going to have to move with his job eventually, and he said, I'm not going too far. I said, why, son? He said, can't get away, can't get too far from my mama. You know, he's not going to leave his mama. So we're kind of glad of that. A male child is given a pattern for relating to the opposite sex that will last his lifetime. A female child is given a pattern of thinking and behaving for how a woman should live her life. Listen, if you want to see what a young girl is going to be like, look at her mother. Women are going to, young girls are going to come pattern themselves after mother especially if she is a healthy person. Now, children raised without a mother, secondly, if you'll look at pray this, did y'all get a sheet? If you got sheets, forgot to tell you they were back there. Uh, children raised without a mother are left with developmental holes in their heart. I want to read you a article. It's written by a man named Travis Norwood, who does missionary work all over the world, and he, he, this was somewhere, he's called the loudest silence I've ever heard. Let me read you this article. Uh, the sound of a baby crying is one of the most disturbing sounds there is to the human brain. You might have to agree with that. The military has used the sounds of crying babies to torture people. The noise calls to the lowest parts of our mind and says that something is wrong. When people hear a crying child, their first response is to try to make the noise stop. Bottles, pacifiers, rocking, duct tape. Oh. Anything to alleviate this sound that seems to drill a hole through the head. The cries of a baby are an awful sound. At least that what I, that's what I used to think. In 2006, my wife and I were in uh, Kazakhstan adopting our son, our fourth child. In Kazakhstan, they, had traditional, they have traditional or orphanages. Picture all the images you've seen in movies about orphanages, orphanages except much, much poorer. The, this one was in an old Soviet compound surrounded by a crumbling stone wall. For a few weeks before the adoption, we visited our 16-month-old son every day at the orphanage for about an hour and a half. Most days they would bring him to us, and we would arrive, and a worker would take a diaper from us, bring him back in the diaper in whatever random outfit they could find. Many days he wore pink tights decorated with flowers. The workers sincerely cared for the children. They were simply overwhelmed. The ratio seemed to be about 1 to 30 maybe more. On one particular day, no worker was available to retrieve our son, and we decided to look in and see where he spent most of his time. We cautiously stepped into a room full of cribs, about 20 cribs, each with a child anywhere from a few months to a year or so old. My wife and I both stood there feeling something was very wrong. The room was perfectly peaceful, calm and still. 
silent. We looked to see if all the children were sleeping, only a few. Some sat up in their cribs, mostly on their backs. We knew from visiting our son that he was always hungry. They didn't have enough to feed them all properly. Our son was 16 months old and weighed about 15 pounds. A room of 20 hungry children should be a cacophony of cries. Even if they weren't hungry, some of them should need changing. Some should want attention. Some should want to be held. These children had once cried. It's instinctual. A child cries to tell adults they have needs. But if a child cries over and over, these needs and these needs are never met. If no one comes, they soon learn that crying is pointless. This was an entire room of children who had simply shut down because no one came. It takes about a week, they say, for a baby taken from a mother or an orphan to cry, and at the end of a week, he won't cry anymore because there's no point. There's nothing to gain from it. Do you think that's not developmentally difficult for that person? But he says, if the child cries over and over, these needs aren't met. Uh, this was an entire room of children who had simply shut down. At that moment, if they had asked me to adopt them all, I would have had taken them. Crying is the sound of life. The child is saying, I believe someone will meet my needs. Someone will come. Someone loves me. Crying is a prayer. It's a beautiful sound. And on he goes. But you see the point. When babies are motherless, no one comes to nurture them at that most vulnerable, needy, a developmental stage where they're learning that that, listen, these babies that never get nurtured in that way do not know that it even exists. They say, what is love? I don't understand what love is. You talk about love, and then one day this child grows up and gets married, and their, and their spouse, who's probably more of a healthy person, says, why is there no intimate love here? What does that mean? It's called an attachment disorder. Now, I've given you a, just a, a definition. A reactive attachment disorder of infancy or early childhood is a problem in which a child is not able to easily form a normal or loving relationship with others. It is considered to be a result of not forming an attachment to any specific caregiver when very young. So this child goes through this stage where attachment is what's supposed to happen. The bond with a mother is to form, and it never does. There is no mother to form that bond. And therefore, this child goes completely through that phase. You know, it's like, it's like going through the phase of learning to walk without, ever, without having any legs. You know, there's no stimulus to allow the child to, to know there's something that will come back. There's, there's love to be gained. So, the child enters life as a blank slate. All children do, and they know nothing and have experienced nothing. But the child comes into this world feeling the need for love, warmth, attention, affection. And this child cries instinctively, naturally, for someone to meet those needs. If you've had children, you know this. If there is no one to respond, especially a mother, the child passes through this bonding and attaching phase without experiencing any love or affection. Uh, Rick was saying yesterday at the prayer that the, he heard stories about the Soviet Union. When all of that came apart over there, these just hundreds and thousands of, of children that were abandoned and put into orphanage, just rooms with, with hundreds of, cri of cribs and baby beds just full of children in this condition, in this situation, who later on would be adopted and, and become nightmares for some foster parents. But having passed this critical phase without having had these needs met, the child will conclude there is no such thing as affectionate love. They're incapable of bonding with the spouse or their own kids. Listen, life becomes about just doing, not feeling, not connecting, not relating, 
just becoming a doer. You're a good provider. You show up, but you don't know how to give affection. You can't say I love you. You can't connect emotionally. And this is a very difficult handicap to live with. There are a lot of people in this country right now that are living with that kind of handicap or even worse. So far, the field of psychology has deemed these problems as permanent and insolvable. My professor said, we don't know what to do. There's nothing. I mean, once you pass through that phase where bonding should take place for as a baby, I mean, this is a rudimentary core level. I mean, this is the core of the belief system. This little baby, this is, they're developing their very core heart and soul. And if they miss this, how do you ever go back and give them that? Let me tell you the only way you can do it. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only person that can open up the heart, can open the shut door of the heart. Because see, what they do is they shut down. They quit wanting what they can't have. It's what we all do. Instead of going to God and accepting the fact that we can't have what we want, and so we change what we want to what he wants for us. See, that's the Christian life. As a little baby, you don't have that capacity. You can't, you're not even saved. You don't even have God at all. That's why the old man stuff is so important to understand. Is because you formed all of that in you without God. Really, really messes you up. But, but listen, only Christ can open the shut door of an empty heart that hungers for what this person doesn't even know what they hunger for. Doesn't even know. Thirdly, you, the United States is filled with children who've been abandoned, neglected, abused, and used. They need Christ. This is James 127. This was the situation in first century Israel. In James 127, he's talking to pompous hearers of the word who have not yet become doers of God's will. A time, listen, this was a time of extreme hardship in Israel. There was a famine, there was persecution, big time. This was the heyday of Paul and, and beyond. And this is when Paul went and took this great offering. You know, the first and second Corinthians are all about this great offering that he took among the Gentile churches to take to Jerusalem, to the, to the home church. It's because they were in such dire need. And listen, parents who had been converted to Christianity were being put in jail and executed, and their children were just abandoned. So who took them? The church. The church picked them up and took them. And somebody nurtured them. Somebody helped them as best they could. Listen, that's us. Today in America, that's us. That's the church. The government can't do it. Listen, the government tries whoever, some well-intentioned person. I mean, there might have been a day of sanity in this country when somebody could have done a decent job with that, but today it's insane. Listen, the... The call, uh, all of this transgender stuff, you know what I'm talking about? The fact that there's no such thing as male or female. Listen, in the court system, what's happening, they used to, they used to give the mother primary right for, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Custody. No longer. No longer. It's a 50-50 crapshoot now. Fathers, maybe they're good, maybe they're not. Listen, this whole idea that a mother is more important than a father, forget that because that would be discriminating. That might hurt somebody's feelings. So, it's insane where we're going in our country. Of course, it's the devil, and he's trying to destroy freedom trying to pull his, his whole world together. But this was, the, this was the situation in first century Israel. A lot of children who lost their parents and made orphans. Their real, James is telling them the real spiritual service is, look, look, you come to church and, you, and you're all pompous and you give your money and all this and you're wealthy and you've, 
you're well to do and you think that you've got it going on and everything, but look, here's a real spiritual service. See these people in need? These widows and these orphans? There's your service. There's your service. In 1 John 3.18, John says, Little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's get real. Let's get real. Now, how do we nurture the motherless, which is the call, the encouragement from me today? For my life, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while. Since I heard there were children at Children's Hospital with cancer whose parents quit coming to see them after a time because the parents just can't do it. They can't stand to see them suffering like that. I mean, hey, you've seen your children suffer. You know how it hurts. There are children up at Children's Hospital that don't get visited by their own parents as often as they should have. Since I heard that, uh, I wept over that. But what can we do? We can pray. We can ask God to send their needs to with someone along with the gospel. We can look around our own neighborhood, our own school and church. We can look for kids who are in need and give them a moment of your time. A pat on the back. A word of encouragement. A compliment. Uh, an offer to take them to lunch or whatever. Uh, a look at their life that says, you're important enough for me to stop and give you attention. Can you imagine a kid without a mother, how starved that child is for attention, for some positive affection and affirmation? Of course, in our world today, you've got to be careful or you'll be a, you'll be a, a pervert. But so... But give them a moment of time, encourage them, give them the gospel, find out about their living situation. Who would be, who would be a foster parent? Who would do that? People do it all the time. I heard a story today, this morning, Rhonda was telling me about someone who works with her who, oh, you just wouldn't believe all the married and divorced and, and abused and everything and then left by their parents and everything and finally picked up by some foster parents who brought some sanity to their life, saved them so they can have a marriage and a family and nurture kids because foster parents intervened in their life and said, I'll stand in the gap for you. I'll give you 10 years of my life while I help you grow up and raise you to adulthood. Who will do that? You support established Christian ministries to orphans, like the Alabama Baptist Children's Home. And I look, I'm just picking that out of the hat, out the internet. I don't know who's talking with Ron earlier. You got to be careful because a lot of times this stuff is a front where you pick this stuff up on the internet and they got all the pictures and everything, but you don't really know what's behind it. So you got to be careful. You want to find something legitimate. Uh, when Glen Haven was operating, then that was a time where we had a place to help. Uh, that's a long story. But you support these missions with your money, with your volunteer. And finally, if, you, if you're so led, and only be led, you know, uh, God, who's the guy from, who's the guy that's got the big home? Uh, from Alabama, Big Oak. Yeah, what's the guy's name? John Kroll. John Jossa. I heard him. He spoke at Gardnell First Baptist. He said, "Listen, we'd love for everybody to be a foster parent, but everybody's not meant to be a foster parent. God doesn't call everybody to be a foster parent. The only person that needs to be a foster parent is those who are called by God to be, because it's a job and a half. It's a job. It's a job." Ask Alan and Lee. It's a job, isn't it? Yeah. So. It never ends. <laughs> yeah. Well, it will one day. You'll be dead and in the ground in, in heaven, and you'll get to go home. So. I know. Come on, Jesus. 
Absolutely. If you don't know, they've taken in their eight-year-old granddaughter, right, and Abby, and she's got some issues and some problems, and, and they're working through all that. And so they need your prayers, and they need you to come and babysit. They need you to take Abby home for a week or two, uh, maybe a month, if you don't mind. Uh, so let's, let's, let's go to the Lord and <clears throat> pray about this. <clears throat> Well, Father, it's a great day to celebrate mothers and how important they are in our life. I thank you for my mother who loved me with all she had. With all she had, Father. And I, I can see her shortcomings now, and I don't mean to talk poorly about her, Father. I just see the truth of it. And she did her best, and I'm just grateful for it. I, th I know many of us feel that way. I'm just grateful to see wonderful mothers, and, and the lady I married is a wonderful mother and nurtures my children, and I just am so grateful. And I pray, Father, for our nation, that we could get back to some common sense. I pray that you would take these liberal people, these people who are confused about what is good and right for a, a child, and I pray that you shut their mouths. I pray that you take their life and remove them from remove evil from this country, whatever it takes, famine, pestilence, whatever it takes, Father, to remove evil from this nation that is destroying our families and our marriages and therefore our children. I, I just ask you to do something to help these kids, and I pray that you'll prepare our hearts and make us willing to do whatever, whatever you call upon us to do. And I just pray all this, Father, in Christ's name, and for your sake, for his sake, amen. <clears throat>